Hello, everyone. I'd like to introduce myself and my administrator teammates. I'm Jenny Lee Hodgins, and today we're joined by uh, a fellow admin for film scoring practice, Jonathan Price. Hey, guys. Film scoring practice admin team is super excited to bring you a special guest today. For those who may not have heard yet, there is a documentary called Score, a film music documentary, which is of great interest to film composers everywhere. Before I introduce our guest today, I'd like to share a bit of background. Score, a film music documentary, came out in theaters June 2017. The documentary was created by a team of people, including Robert Kraft, Trevor Thompson, Jonathan Wilbanks, Kenny Holmes, Nate Gold, and producer-director Matt Schrader, whose IMDb bio states, Matt Schrader is a documentary filmmaker, Emmy award-winning news producer, and a graduate of the University of South, Carol sorry, South Cal California's Annenberg School and School of Cinematic Arts. As a special project, projects producer for news agencies, including CBS and NBC, his investigative journalism has changed lives and laws and returned millions of dollars to consumers and communities. In 2014, he left his job with CBS to pursue SCORE, a film music documentary, a gamble that resulted in one of the most comprehensive collections of interviews with modern maestros ever assembled. SCORE is distributed by... I hope I say this right, Gravitas Ventures, and was released in theaters in June 2017. I'd like to add that the SCORE documentary has won over seven awards from film festivals and was one of the top documentaries of 2017, according to iTunes and Amazon, and was released theatrically in a dozen major regions around the world. Without further ado, I'd like to welcome our very special guest today, producer, editor, cinematographer, Kenny Holmes, who was part Thank of the you. team that created the documentary score. Welcome, Kenny. Thank you so much for having me. It's uh, it's an honor. And I feel I, I may be out of my league here. I'm probably the only non-composer uh, joining us today. That, that's absolutely <laughs> fine. We need to hear from your perspective, you know, because we have to work with uh, producers, cinematographers ourselves. So on behalf of our... Uh, we have now over 4,600 members in film scoring wow. practice. Yeah, I'd like to welcome you so much for and thank you so much for joining us today. Oh, I'm I'm. It's an honor. Thank you for having me. I, you just spoke before we got on this podcast um, with Jonathan and I that you mentioned that you had lived in uh, Denver, and I read somewhere um, in online that you were a cinematographer for KRNV News 4 in Reno, Nevada. Uh, I read that you mentioned you got into making videos in high school and you were introduced by your theater teacher to a local TV news crew. And from there, you honed your skills as a cinematographer and you had been itching to do a documentary next. So before we talk about SCORE, the documentary, would you mind sharing a bit about your background and what you do professionally and how this led to your involvement as a producer for SCORE? Sure, absolutely. Uh, so I am a news photojournalist or as people normally call it, a cameraman. Uh, I cover the daily news from, you know, big events to city politics. Today I'm heading actually down to cover the governor race for California. So I'm, I'm constantly on the move. I spent a, a month in Korea covering the Olympics uh, this past February. So a lot of cool, uh, you know, different experiences in my job. And uh, Reno is actually where I, I grew up um, for about half my life and the first news market I worked in. But I, I started in news and I still work in news and I, I bounced around from city to city. So I've, I've worked in Reno, Sacramento, California, uh, Denver, Colorado, and now uh, I live in work in LA. And um, yeah, I, you know, on a daily basis, I'm doing sort of short documentaries. We interview different people and, and cover stories, and it's a little more fast-paced than a documentary, but uh, I do everything from shoot to edit to present light, um, you know, and put put the talent on television. So it's kind of a, a different way of putting together a, a little film, but um, kind of, you know, honing those skills and having those skills uh, really helped to work on a documentary because it's something I do every single day. Right, right. How, how did this lead to your involvement with the score movie? Well, so um, our director, Matt Schrader, uh, he and I worked together at the CBS affiliate in Sacramento. Um, Matt 
graduated from USC and got hired on as a producer for the investigative uh, journalism team at the station. And I was working in that investigative unit. So we worked together quite a bit every day covering different stories and doing investigations on the news side of things. And we became friends and kind of learned each other's skills and interests. And um, it was probably a couple years later, I had since moved to Denver and then to LA and he was still in Sacramento and he called me out of the blue. And it was kind of funny because I was actually trying to round up anyone I knew. I really want to do a documentary. I think it would be so cool. Anyone have any ideas? And you know, one of the toughest things about doing a film is getting people on board and finding the time to do it. And uh, I had just moved out to LA and some of my friends that lived here were all super busy with some projects. So it kind of fell flat. And then out of the blue, Matt called and said, Hey, I've got an idea. Do you want to work with me on this? And I'm going to move to LA. And so from there, it was kind of like, tell me more, tell me more. And he, you know, gave me a call and we, we had a meeting about the idea. And you know, film scoring for me, I I would say I was a casual film score fan. Um, but once I started working on the project and it started moving forward, I became to realize that I was more than a casual fan. And I feel like a lot of people will probably feel the same way if they haven't already, that the the music of, of film is sort of embedded in your childhood and, and in your life. And it it lives inside you. And, you know, once you start doing a project like that and realizing what you're listening to, it's how, how much knowledge I had about film scoring that I didn't really realize. And, uh, you know, then it's, then it just, I realized at that point, man, I don't own enough film scores. I don't know enough about this. And it was just, I, I became almost obsessed with the concept. It's such a cool process. And there's so much incredible talent out there that, Uh, you know, it was just, it was a joy to bring that to the forefront of uh, film a little bit with this project. That's awesome. So Kenny, Matt was saying um, that he wanted to create something different that you guys hadn't done before. And he wanted to look at composing. Um, I guess what, one, what did you guys, I guess, what was the aim and what was the goal of this documentary? And then to how were the composers chosen? Well, the the idea for the documentary, first off, was Matt was looking for <laughs> the the story's kind of funny. Matt was looking for a something to watch. He was looking for a documentary to watch on film scoring. He had seen a Finding Nemo, mm-hmm. one of those bonus features in a Blu-ray, and thought, wow, this was really cool. I want to watch more about this. So he looked online for a documentary and he was like, how is there not a documentary on this? And so he waited a little while and then revisited it a couple years. And that's when it hit him. He's like, you know what? I've, I'm graduated now. I've got some, I saved up some money from my job. So I'm going to put it together. And so that's when we started first having the discussion and how the composers were selected was, you know, in the initial stages is like, who will talk to us? Um, we were not a existing film company. We don't have any mm-hmm. film credits. I mean, we have our news resumes, but you know, composers are busy enough as it is. And I'm sure people right. are constantly knocking on the door, but in the beginning it was kind of like, you know, who, who can we talk to, to give us some insight on this? So we started with agents and people that know the composers to kind of, you know, build a little trust, let them know who we are. Initially we'd walk in the room and they say, Oh, what, what college project are you guys working on? And, uh, you know, <laughs> eventually we started kind of, uh, pitching our idea and and letting the the agents and the industry people understand what the goal was. And then before we knew it, we had, you know, some composers. Um, We're very lucky that John Debney was the first composer to sit down with us. And he's so great and such a a nice, nice man, aside from being an incredible Oscar-nominated composer. But, you know, once one composer agrees and maybe passes along the info about what we're doing, it sort of opens the door and says, oh, well, John did it, no problem. Uh, yeah, no, you know, I'll, I'll set aside some time. And then, you know, before you know it, we're sitting in the studio with Hans Zimmer and having a meltdown because <laughs> <laughs> it was just just a couple of months earlier where we were like, hey, maybe someone will talk to us. And it, it was just kind of surreal. And at that point, you know, seeing the joy in Hans uh, about you know, hearing that we were doing this project. And the first thing he said when we were finished interviewing him was, 
you know, who can I call? And he made a couple calls on our behalf to, to get some people to talk with us. And that was just such a cool moment for us. And I think equally though, I think he, he thought it was pretty cool that we were doing something that was putting a spotlight that was long overdue on composers. Right. Thank you so much. You, you really, your stories really show the importance of building relationships in, in this business. And, uh, I know that you said that you're not a composer, but the way that you've just described, you know, the meaning of the film music to you is is really relevant to us as composers. So my, it kind of leads to the next question. Um, what do you feel the film reveals that would be useful for aspiring composers? Is there anything that comes to mind? Um, you know, well, the goal of the film was not only to attract the film composer audience, but also the mainstream audience. Um, you know, we kept it pretty simple. We didn't get to, uh, you know, music theory. We didn't dive into anything like that because, as you, as I mentioned, Matt and I and and our, a lot most of our crew are not musicians. So we wanted this to be attainable to the average film watcher. Um, but for composers, I think, you know, after talking to a lot of these these super talented composers, they all kind of have a similar feeling about what they do. And that is they're vulnerable and, and they're scared all the time. And a new project is always intimidating and scary. And, you know, even the best of the best don't sit down and magically write an Oscar winning theme or, you know, something that's memorable. It, it, it takes trial and error and sleepless nights. And we hear the same stories from these incredible composers that I'm sure a lot of uh, you know aspiring composers probably have those same fears and and you know self doubt and stuff like that. And so I think it's important to see the people at the top of their game having those same problems even after they've made it and at, at are at the top of the game. Side question: Have you personally worked with a lot of composers, or is most of your stuff just on the production side? Yeah, I, I mean, we were lucky to bring on a super talented composer for score. We, mm -hmm. There's a couple of uh, original cues in the theme, including the the closing theme and a couple of sequences in the right. movie. And um, I didn't work a lot with Ryan, um, Matt. Okay. Mostly worked with Ryan Talbert on those themes, um, so I don't have a huge, uh, yeah, I don't so, have I don't have much of a history of working with composers. So I guess my question would be like, when you have or when you and Matt are either working with composers or you think you would work with a composer in the future, what do you think that composers should know for dealing with producers and talking with them and trying to understand the language both from a producer standpoint and then from a composer standpoint? I would say, well, you know, one of the connections we've made in this whole process is working with Robert Kraft and Robert mm -hmm. Kraft joined our team. He's, he used to be the president of Fox music for like 20 years and he oversaw mm -hmm. some of the biggest films in Hollywood, Avatar, Titanic, just to name a few. They happen to be James Cameron, James Horner films, but uh, just to name a few. And, you know, one of the things Robert preaches a lot about composers is the difference between a composer and, you know, a rock star or a musician is the ability to, to, to work as a team and to have humility and be humble. And, you know, when mm -hmm. somebody says, this isn't what I want, instead of saying, well, that's what you get, you've got to go back to the drawing board and, and make the filmmakers happy with yeah. what they want to make. And I, mm -hmm. you know, you, you really have to be prepared to be shut down and, I, I'm not even sure I could be a composer because when you put that much effort into something and constantly get shut down and say, that's not right, that's not right. Um, you know, Michael Dana, who won the Oscar for Life of Pi, was was just about fired from the job. And, you know, Robert worked with him on that film, Robert Kraft. He's actually our guest next week, so we're going to talk a little bit about, uh, on our podcast, um, we're going to talk a little bit about that story and how that all unfolded. But he ended up winning the Oscar for the film that he almost got fired on, and it's kind of a full circle moment where, you know, they, they were able to tweak and change some things and, and really found a great sound. And it's just an example of, you know, teamwork and finding a way to make it work. And that's, I think, why there are differences between a, you know, a, 
a musician, pop artist, and a composer. They may be able to write the music, but you know, the pop artist is my way or the highway, and the composer for a film is is very much involved in the process and making things work as a team. And it, it really comes back to again humility and being humble enough to accept that and and work together with the director and the producers to make uh, w- w- the ultimate goal, which is a great film. Right. Thank you so much. Uh, w- and definitely we will we will ask some questions in a little bit about the podcast that you just mentioned uh, a yeah. little bit later in the interview. But I want to ask again, uh, or actually kind of go back a little bit to uh, when you and Matt and your team were putting together uh, this documentary, what kind of research did you have to do? Pers- did you have to do the research yourself? Yeah, there was a lot of research done. Um, absolutely. I mean, for one, a lot of the films we were looking into and talking about, um, you know, were <laughs> out before we were born or when we were very young. So um, there's definitely, you know, researching the most famous film scores and the the game changing film scores and some of the iconic maestros of, you know, the 50s, 60s, 70s and and even 80s that we weren't old enough to remember and had to sort of go back to the drawing board about. And then just, you know, um, Matt and I are journalists, so we're used to, with any interview, uh, researching who we're talking to and and figuring out, you know, journalists, w- one of the things we do best is learn on the fly because you, you're, you're covering something every day and it's different. So you're, you're never going to be an expert on everything. Um, and that's no secret. So you have to study and you have to be prepared in those interviews. And when you sit down with, you know, we, we did over 60 interviews. So there was a lot of uh, a lot of prep and every interview was over an hour long. So you can imagine how much went into that. And our, our other uh, producer, Trevor Thompson, who's also a journalist, he he uh, conducted most of the interviews and um he did a stellar job of just being prepared and, you know, you could, you could tell that the composers were happy and, you know, that we didn't sit down and say, so what's your favorite film of all time? (laughs) And just kind of generic questions like that, because I'm sure they hear that so much. And we, we really wanted to dive deep into stuff that they hadn't talked about before. Hey, so you were talking briefly about some of the composers and how interesting their, their stories were. What are some of the commonalities that you guys found in dealing with composers that you may not have realized before, and it, I guess in main regards to their success stories? Um, <laughs> well, first off, commonalities is fear. They're all terrified. Um, but <laughs> it, it, it makes for a, it, it's funny because they all have a, that's like I said earlier, that, that similar fear of deadlines and, you know, coming onto a project and, you know, sitting there with a blank piece of paper and never, nothing coming out. Uh, but I would say, uh, as far as success stories go, it seems like most of the composers that we talked to, they're all really hardworking, and they were able to strike at the moment. Um, you know, a lot of there's a lot of apprenticeship in the composing world. A lot of interns become what they are to uh, you know as as composers. Uh, for example, Ramin Javadi, who does Game of Thrones and Westworld. He worked under Hans Zimmer and Klaus Badel uh, at Remote Control Productions. And, you know, he showed up one day and knocked on the door and said, I'll do whatever I can. And, you know, he he was a coffee boy for a while at the office. And one night they were working on, I think it was, uh, I think it was Pirates of the Caribbean. And he said, hey, can I have a crack at this, this cue? And they were like, you never talk. Who are you? <laughs> and you know he he stayed overnight and worked on a queue and the next morning they were like hey that's pretty good and next thing you know they're they're throwing him little little pieces to you know assist on and next thing you know you're you're scoring game of thrones so um it, it seems like the the composing world is they 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 believe in the idea of apprenticeship and it still exists and it's something that goes back for hundreds of years. And it's really cool to see that, you know, a lot of the composers work under somebody. And then when there's a moment that the composer that their, you know, their apprentice is, is ready, they feel is ready, then they, they may throw him a bone and, and give him a shot. But the, you know, the other thing, Bear McCreary brought up something too. And nowadays, uh, something really important for composers is to just always be writing. 
there's so many things there's so many things that need original music with YouTube and you know documentaries coming out left and right we're in the golden age of documentaries and we have all these platforms with different media there there's always going to be composers needed and it may not be the big hollywood film right out of right out of the gate but you've got to always be ready and always be writing fresh stuff and be ready for that moment because if somebody comes calling and you're you're rusty you know that may be your only chance to prove yourself so just i th- i think yeah, just always be writing and always be ready and and hungry, you know. And don't do it for the fame. Do it for the joy of of writing the music. And I think, you know, that's what we see a lot with musicians: is the people that do the best work and succeed the most are the people that do it for the love of it. I mean, there's so many musicians out there that are still touring, that are that have more money than they could ever spend, and it's never been about that, and it really shows. And that is su- such a, an in- encouraging story to all of our members. Some aspiring, some are semi-professional, some are you know working full-time as professional composers. So this really goes to the root of you know be a team player and, and serve the film. Um, but I want to kind of switch gears with the next question. I, I read um, a little bit of some of your previous uh, interviews, and you had spoken briefly about for this for the score movie that you had done some, you know, filming for the movie in London's Abbey Road Studios. Could you tell us a little bit about your experience with that? Well, first off, it was unreal. And I, it's, I, I bought everything in the gift shop. (laughs) Um, I, I have coffee mugs and I mean, and, and the gift shops inside the doors. I don't even know who buys stuff from there. I can't imagine like a composer that's there weekly is buying stuff, but I think the guy at the register was really excited when I went in there because it didn't seem like people go in there very much. But um, it w- yeah, it was it was really great, and it's actually uh, <laughs> it didn't start off so well though because we got there to set up, and there's an upstairs little area, and you know we traveled from the United States with all of our equipment, and we tried to make stuff portable, but we had to bring some uh, power converter transformers, and. <laughs> As we were setting up, we made the mistake of not checking with the engineer and we plugged in a transformer and knocked the power out of Abbey Road right before they started scoring oh Mission God. Impossible. <laughs> and so it started off a little rocky and <laughs> I don't know if I've told that story before publicly, but um, it, they, they were all really nice and they were like, just don't plug anything in without telling us. And we were like, we're so sorry. Don't kick us out. Oh my God. Um, but... After that, yeah, it was it was really cool to just be in the walls and, you know, inside the walls and hear the stories of the Beatles and John Williams. And just, I mean, while we were there, uh, Seth MacFarlane was recording an album. And at, at one point, Chris Martin from Coldplay walked into the studio to listen to some of the recording of the soundtrack. So it's just like there's just it's just music. It's legends of music walking around constantly and. You know, you of course just gotta kind of not fanboy out and just <laughs> act like you belong. But it it was really cool, and I feel like even people that do belong there, like you feel that that feeling in the air when you're there of just the history of the place. Um, but yeah, it, it it's really a, a cool place, and it's it's interesting too because there's so much going on there, and. I don't know if it's just the way England is, but like in the United States, you know, here in in Los Angeles with all the studios, there's so much security and these guard gates and stuff is buried on these lots. But Abbey Road's just right on the street and there's one fence and it's just right there and everyone respects it. And there's photos being taken and pictures and people are signing the wall 24 seven. And it's just a magical place. And we were so lucky to it was a short time that we spent in there to shoot the scene because of uh, you know some of the guests they had during the scoring session, so they didn't want a bunch of cameras in there. Um, but it, it was it was definitely a memorable moment, and I I remember thinking like I'm so lucky to to be shooting this and be here, but it was also very cool to be able to take all of that footage and share it, and then the way score kind of blew up the way it did and, and got out there. The fact that everyone got to see that footage is it's special to us. Cause you know, we had no idea what was going to come of score and to have that many people get to see what we were able to experience is, is a special thing for us. That's really cool. Um, you were briefly talking about 
uh, how you guys um, knocked out the power to Abbey Road. Do you guys, <laughs> do you guys, Breaking that's, news. That's fantastic. Like, just fantastic. Um, do you have any other like funny stories or anything that didn't make it into the documentary that you were kind of like, man, that should have been in there, but I'm kind of glad it's not because we would have been in a lot of trouble. Um, no, nothing that would get us in trouble. Um, <laughs> I, I just think one, one really special moment for all of us that kind of brought us to the forefront of like, wow, this thing's really happening is, um, I mentioned when we were in Hans Zimmer's studio and, you know, when we, when we got his, his people to agree to, you know, sit down for the interview. Um, they were like, you know, you have one hour and we were like, no problem. So we got there, we set up and we were like, all right, we're set up, you know, start the time. And, and Hans walked in and he was like, Hey guys. And it, I, I, for some reason I expected it to be like, you have one hour, I'm sitting down now, go. And yeah, instead it was like, way. do you mind if I have a smoke? And he sat down and, and chatted <laughs> with us a little bit. And then we, we did the interview and it was, it was, much more than an hour, which we were so lucky for. And then after we finished, he was like, do you mind if I hang around while we were putting stuff away? And it was, it was like the slowest breakdown of any shoot we did. Cause he That's was just awesome. chatting with us and he was telling us stories about stuff on his desk and different collectibles he had. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, generally interested in our project. And then, um, I told you I work in news, uh, then like six or seven months later, I was covering the Grammys and I was on the red carpet and there was, you know, stars left and right walking by and I saw Hans Zimmer walk by. And of course, you know, sadly, he wasn't getting pulled left and right by all the media because right. you have right. Justin Bieber or whomever right. walking by. And I said, we got to talk to Hans. So I called him over and I, it was really cool. I, I, I was like, I don't know if you remember me, but we, we shot the interview with you for the documentary we're making and his eyes lit up and he was like, Oh, when does it come out? I can't wait. I'm mm -hmm. so excited for this. I was telling people about it and it was like, you know, it, it wasn't just like he was sugarcoating and while we were there, like he was, right. he was right. generally genuinely interested in what we were doing. And, and it, it, the, the way he lit up, like that's another moment that I won't forget. And, you know, it, it just goes to show you what kind of guy he is, not only as a, a, a tremendous composer, but just like caring for people and projects. And it, it all goes back to that apprenticeship thing. Like he wants people to succeed and he was excited about our project. And he even called Matt one time out of the blue and asked how things were going. And uh, <laughs> Matt was like, I wish I could record phone calls, but Hans Zimmer just called me. And I was like, oh man, that's crazy. So th that was a that was just a special moment for us, just th the time he spent with us. And and that's the same case with uh, all the composers. When nobody was, you know, oh, is this over yet or what's this about? Everyone was excited to talk to us. But th that was one that just stood out for sure. sure. Well, thank you so much for that. That, that is so encouraging to hear. And yeah, I want to I want to kind of switch gears again and, and uh, actually kind of move toward. Uh, what's coming up in the future for you? Do you have any intent, first of all, to follow up on this documentary with any film projects related to composers? and Or do you have any other um, documentaries brewing for the future on different subjects that you'd like to talk about? Well, um, as far as the documentary goes, one of the, the biggest comments or, or repetitive comments we heard about score was, I could have watched for six hours. I wish it was longer. I wish it was longer. And, you know, while we were making the film... Matt and I had talked about turning, you know, our, our extra interview, you know, we had so many interviews that were so long and, and not a lot of it made it into the film. And so we had this idea of maybe we'll put the raw interviews on a podcast and we'll release them once a week or something like that. And that idea was thrown around for a while, but we were really busy putting the movie together. So it kind of fell flat. And once we kind of wrapped the film and everything calmed down, the idea of the podcast happened and it was like well you know should we do that with the with the interviews and then it was like well maybe you know we've we've de developed a good relationship with these composers plus um you know with Robert Kraft who who knows many of the composers and and has great relationships with them we said you know what if we could we possibly do a weekly show is that too hard to grasp with the scheduling and so that the the podcast is sort of a continuation of the documentary and it's it's much more raw and that was the idea is to you know there were so many people saying give us more give us more and so that was the idea behind that and so far it's been great as far as films go um 
one of my favorite things about Matt Schrader is that he's always creating. The, he never sleeps. He'll text me at three in the morning and he's like, what do you think about this? Or I just, I just designed this logo up. What do you think about it? He's always creating. And so there always are ideas brewing and we've talked about some things, nothing that we would put out there yet, but um, we're, we're putting something together. Eventually you haven't heard the last from us, but uh, for now the podcast is taking up a good amount of time between our, our regular life schedule uh, for now. And, and we're having a really good time with it and it's, it's growing pretty quick. Uh, we're seeing some good response from it. So it's, it's been great so far. It's so incredible. Can you tell us where we can find that specifically? So for our listeners, they know how to look for that. Oh, the podcast. Yes. It, well, it's, it's, uh, it's another incredible title score the podcast. It's really hard to, <laughs> <laughs> our, our creative team <laughs> spent a lot on that. But um, <laughs> uh, the the podcast is found on on all the major podcast platforms. You can find it on Apple Podcasts, uh, Spotify, Stitcher, uh, TuneIn. Um, there's also a if you go to our website score dash movie slash podcast. I think you can watch it on there. They're on YouTube. We pretty much put them everywhere. I think most of uh, podcasts are consumed on Apple Podcasts, so that's that's the place we point people to the most. Um, but if you can't find it, you can tweet us at score the podcast and we'll help you. That's awesome, man. It's been so much fun having you on one quick question for me though, if you don't mind. Sure. Um, so was there a particular composer that you were just completely enamored with that you were just like, wow, I can't believe I'm talking to you. And what was that like? Um, my, well, I, I did. And you know, the only composer that I took a, photo with while we were shooting the film was Quincy Jones. Really? And I grew up, my, my dad was in radio. Um, he's retired 35 years and I grew up listening to so much different music. And, and, you know, one of my first albums I ever had was a Michael Jackson album. And I was, I'm just such a big fan of Quincy Jones and to sit in the room and chat with him. And he's another guy actually that, uh, when we finished interviewing him, I mean, I, I'm not sure how old he is now, but he's he's getting up there and he's still on the grind. He, he has so much love for the industry. He sat with us for like 90 minutes wow. after the interview on YouTube showing us artists he's scouting that he wants to sign Jeez. and and make records for. And um, so that was that was one that. For me, I was like, man, and you know, we we did it at his house, and we walked through his. He has this hallway of all the Michael Jack. It was like a museum of Michael Jackson wow. awards and Grammys, and just every. It, it was a surreal moment to to be there with him, and just again, the fact that he was just so like, guys, stick around. I don't, are you familiar mm. with the movie Wayne's World? Oh, yeah. <laughs> when, when Alice Cooper's like, stick around, yeah. hang out with us, and yeah. they're like, uh. What? <laughs> it was that was kind of a moment for me where I was like, wow, this is this is really cool. I'm I'm lucky to be doing this and and to be sitting here among such legendary people and uh yeah, so I would say Quincy Jones was one of those for me. Um but god, there's it's it's hard to even think about how many people we interviewed because again, there was like 60 something. Um uh, but that that one stands out to That's me for ridiculous. sure. That's awesome. Thank you so much for sharing all of that. You really are a testament to the fact that the most successful people tend to be the most hardworking and humble people. You've, you've shared examples of that with these great composers, but your behavior, your, your attitude through this podcast really shows you're of the same caliber person. And we are so you know, grateful oh, that you've you. spent time with us. Yeah. So I just want to thank you. We're going to, we're going to wrap up and I, I just you know, we are so grateful. I know our film scoring practice members are going to be ecstatic to hear from you and to learn more about the pot, the score podcast as well. Yeah. Um, uh, make sure if, if people want to, uh, check out the film too, if you're, I'm not sure how, where your, uh, your audience reaches, but in the United States, uh, score is on Hulu. If you want to watch it, it's awesome. If you're a, if you're a Hulu member, um, but otherwise, if yeah, if you want to reach out to us or you want to hear someone as a guest on our podcast, you could you can hit us up on uh, Twitter at Score the Podcast and 
and check it out. But yeah, we encourage everyone to check it out. We have a fun time chatting with the composers and um, we've had some pretty cool big guests already uh, in just the short time we've been doing it. So be sure to check it out. Awesome. It's wonderful. Well, I personally own that DVD and I've watched it many, many times. Oh, that's <laughs> I'm going to watch Thank it again you. after this. So this uh, this wraps up our film scoring practice interview with documentary producer, editor, cinematographer Kenny Holmes. And along with our film scoring practice uh, fellow composer, admin, Jonathan Price. So thank you so much again. And, and thank you for listening, everybody. Have a wonderful day. Man, what a fun interview that was. Thank you guys so much for sticking with us to the end. And if you like this kind of stuff, let us know in the comment section below or here in uh, Film Scoring Practice or over on our YouTube, uh, in the YouTube channel. Next week, we're going to be looking at and continuing our series in the brass orchestration. It'll be part two next week. So um, stay tuned for that. And we have other interviews coming up. And once we get those confirmed, we will um, let you know when those will be happening. So uh, thanks again, guys, for all your love and support. And keep uh, participating in all the discussions and all the questions and all the, the posts and everything like that keep it coming it's amazing we are doing some amazing stuff here and so um, tell your friends tell your family about this group and get them involved awesome all right guys we'll talk to you later have an incredible week be blessed <laughs>